I'm now going to uh, request each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raghavendra Vaidya. Um, I'm with GE. I'm the regional CIO for uh, Global Research Centers in Asia and Europe. We have three big centers and a few small ones. One of the biggest centers uh, of global research is in Bangalore. We have another one in Shanghai and another one in uh, Munich in Germany. So I've been with GE for 13 years. i worked with pretty much all GE businesses, ranging from aircraft engines to energy to uh, capital and now with global research. Uh, I'm Amresh Siva. I uh, am the director for engineering at Target.com. I lead a whole bunch uh, the development and delivery of a whole bunch of applications that support Target.com. Uh, we have centers, technology centers uh, in Bangalore, uh, Minneapolis, of course, that's where we are headquartered, um, and uh, San Francisco as well. A lot of our big data analytics work um, happens, uh, again, out of Bangalore, SFO, and uh, a little bit in Minneapolis as well. So that's what uh, we've got. Um, Target is a retail company. Um, so we were the second uh, largest retailer. Uh, we are the second largest retailer in the U.S. Um, for some folks that don't know, we are also the fourth largest real estate company in the U.S. Uh, because of the stores that we have. We have about 1,800 stores. Um, and we were the mobile retailer of 2013 as well. Um, we are the, I think, 10th most innovative company uh, as per fast company, 29th most admired company uh, according to Fortune. Uh, and our uh, and our investment community actually expects us to make profits also. Well, we do all that. Okay, unlike some of our competition. My name is Ramesh Haryar, and uh, I'm an academic turned entrepreneur. I was a PhD in computer science and spent uh, joined the Indian Institute of Sciences faculty in 1995. Spent several years there. Continue to be an adjunct professor there, but around the turn of the millennium. 2000, I and some colleagues started a company called Strand Life Sciences that has since then grown to substantially to a 200 member company now. A very interesting company in the sense that it's rare to find a company that's 50% IT folks like you guys and 50% biologists and probably no other company like that is around. Um, what we do is um, to use analytics to understand biological systems and then apply it to um, medical applications. That's what I talk about a bit more. Good evening everyone, how's everybody? Okay, my name is Sachin Garg. Um, I currently work at American Express and I lead the Big Data Labs right here in Bangalore. Um, we are about two and a half years old uh, when we started for American Express. So prior to that, <coughs> I was working in Yahoo Labs and uh, I was leading the Ad Sciences team. It was all about building uh, machine learning models for uh, showing the right ad to the right person at the right time. Before that, I was in the U.S. many years working as a research scientist in Bell Labs, and uh, I'm a wannabe academic. Never, never became an academician uh, until I finished it. Um, but uh, you know, I do have a good academic background, so I try to bring it to work as well. In terms of Amex uh, uh, presence, you know, we uh, in Bangalore we have about 300 people here. 100% um, of big data work is done out of Bangalore. You know, big data labs. Globally, we are the only big data lab to have it in Bangalore. So, you know, that's something we are really proud of as well. Um, on top of that, the core decision science slash analytics for Amex, and, you know, like the top big decision for many other companies as well, uh, is done out of here, you know, not just Bangalore, but here as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we do when we develop the specifics of uh, real time data and analytics and things like that. Thank you all. I'd probably like to take a few minutes to explain the panel format for you. Uh, we have another hour and 15 minutes uh, with us uh, to delve on the topic. We will actually have three different segments and we will have audience interaction at the end of each segment. So my request to the audience is uh, please, uh, uh, you know, you have enough uh, opportunity to interact at the end of each segment uh, so that you don't have to wait to the end to ask questions. Uh, please feel free to ask as many questions as you have. Uh, but uh, uh, please restrict your questions to the topic related to the segment of the participant. Right? So we'll have three segments on the topic. The first one will be to, uh, to introduce you to the industry vertical and the kind of uh, uh, business problems that they're trying to solve and, and the kind of insights that they're trying to get. And uh, 
what are some of the use cases that we're trying to use, uh, uh, you know, uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics in, right? And then we'll have the second segment, which will be more related to the, the technology platforms and uh, building blocks that they have been using in their respective industry verticals and uh, what are the different uh, experiences that they've had in terms of putting together the kind of uh, challenges that they came across uh, in putting those together as well. So that will be segment two. Uh, so the second part uh, will be, uh, we'll be delving into a lot more into technical as well. And then the final segment uh, is around the benefits that business accrued from um, the investment that they made in terms of the analytics, uh, the kind of unsolved problems that they still have in those respective industry verticals, and also uh, with regards to uh, you know uh, limitations that they see with the current uh, the technology uh, landscape. So we have just got um, a plethora of industry verticals, some of the biggest names in those industries, and obviously they've been grappling with some of the biggest problems that business can pose. Uh, and uh, IT always uh, tries to do its best to be an enabler for business. Uh, that's always a challenge that uh, CIOs uh, have in, in, in letting IT be an enabler for business all the time, and, and uh, demonstrating value all the time. So we'll. Uh, so these are the three segments that we have. We have about ten minutes uh, for questions at the end of each segment. With that, uh, uh, we'll probably just jump into the first uh, segment. The first segment's around. Uh, like I said, uh, a quick deep dive into each of these industry verticals. And uh, uh, over to you, Rupa. Start. Thanks, sir. So let me just talk about American Express. Um, you know, the business of American Express is extremely simple. It's a payments company. Um, it enables people to be able to make payments in Skype. So, you know, by way of uh, giving credit to payment cards, which is Visa, Plastic, Bank, Habits, etc. Um, to give you uh, some sense of scale, um, you know, Amex, American Express has more than 100 million cards in force, uh, and I'm talking about global numbers. Uh, it processed more than a billion transactions, um, uh, you know, across these 100 million customers, and more than tens of millions of users. So you basically swipe your card, you are a customer of Amex. Merchant, you swipe your card at the, you know, that shop is a customer of Amex, and the payment that the, the network that carries the payment that is owned by Amex. So this unique proposition at scale, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, billions, is something we call closed loop insight. And what that means is, uh, American Express has direct relationships with both mass end consumers as well as merchants, and they own the payment. So if you differentiate Amex from say, Visa, Visa doesn't. Bank, which comes to you with your credit card, Visa is not going to do that exact same thing for you. Right? So, uh, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because Amex gets data both from the consumer side, you know, where, where are you spending, you know, when are you spending, how much are you spending, but also from the merchant side. So, the merchants give Amex data that we don't get directly by the swipe that you do in the shop. And the combination of data is what Amex calls closed loop, and it's a unique advantage for Amex compared to its. That's one thing I wanted to mention, and the scale, of course. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know businesses that are spread across, Amex is present in more than 130 countries. Uh, some, most of the countries, you can get a card from Amex card. In some countries, you can get one card from us. Uh, so that's kind of the basic business we have. And these billion transactions that happen every time you swipe, something happens at Amex. We talk more about that in the next part of the presentation. With that, let me pass it on back to you. Um, so I want to talk about what we do, which is primarily analytics. If you were to put a you know, thirty thousand view to it, foot view to it, analytics in the healthcare sector. So how many of you have seen the serial called Doctor House? So everybody's familiar with it, and you know every every case is a mystery, every case is a detective um, story. That's, that's not uncommon. A lot of cases are simple, but many, many cases are difficult to solve and doctors struggle. And you'll be surprised to know that that number is quite large. And so, to solve those cases, they need to look inside. They'll be in doctor's house, they'll be running these tests one after the other. The number of tests that doctors run, and that only takes them so far. There's a 
whole level of details beyond that that exists inside the human body that is not easy to get to and our ability to get to it has really started to get better and better over the last few years and we reached a point today at which companies like strand can actually allow doctors to look far deeper into human bodies than has been possible even a year ago um so let me give you an example of what that means so inside deep inside our bodies is dna um dna is a long string and then um it somehow determines various things that your body does and for instance cancer is a, a million people in india get cancer every year no question that happens because through our lifetimes we the dna changes a little bit and that leads to cancer now cancer treatment is one big challenge worldwide and doctors are largely groping in the dark uh to be able to you know do better at it they need to look inside and see what is causing the cancer cancer is not a single disease it's a spectrum of many different diseases and to be able to look deep inside and say this is what is causing the cancer and therefore treat accordingly is is one big challenge that it is um now where does analytics come in whenever you go deep inside into the human body um you can't take a simple snapshot picture like an x-ray it's not an image that you get you get a lot of data and i'll introduce that further in the next session you get a lot of data a lot of um, data that has to be analyzed and it has to be delivered to the doctor in time for him to make a decision and in a form in which he can make a decision so there's a lot of technology pieces that go in there and we'll talk about that further in the next session thank you so uh, so as i said target is in the retail industry uh, we have about 1800 stores uh, in the us we also sell Our online channel target.com. We also have about 120, 150 stores in Canada, um, and we also have uh, ways to sell outside of target.com. So we have a market. We have a sh- we have a store on eBay, for instance, and there are other um, small acquisitions that we have too. Um, you know, Sachin talked about the size of transactions, uh, for instance. So we have an estimated 70 million guests that shop uh, every year, and I say estimated because a lot of times we don't even know our guests. Right? So you can imagine a guest walking to the store, uh, pay by cash, and they walk out, and we have no idea um, who they are. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, we, we estimate again about six billion transactions that happen every year across our stores and dot com. Um, so that's the kind of data that we've got to deal with. Um, I think everybody understands the retail business, but some of the things that we also do, we've got. Um, you know fulfillment centers and distribution centers from which we uh, either directly ship to the guest or ship to the stores um we also uh, operate through what are called direct ship vendors so these are vendors that actually display their product uh, on our site the inventory belongs to them um and then they ship directly um, to the guests as well so that's another thing that we do um and what three if i were to name three big things that we are um, actually doing in the, in the business right from a business perspective Um, the first one is mobile. As I said, we were a mobile retailer of 2013. Um, everybody that goes to shop, I think the first thing that you do is, you know, even if you are in a store, you yank out your mobile. Uh, you're probably looking at recommendations. You're looking. You're comparing prices. You're doing whatever else. And you're probably even Facebooking or tweeting, right, to find out uh, who's bought what uh, before you make a purchase. So mobile is a very important uh, um, uh, element in the whole purchase cycle, irrespective of whether you transact on the mobile uh, on the device in front of you. um the second piece is omni channel um i think one of the big um uh you know weapons that we have in our arsenal is really the fact that we've got stores along with target.com and we are working very hard at bringing guest experiences uh making it seamless across our .com and um, stores this is the second big thing that we do and the third thing of course is as we bring all of these together how do we um personalize um you know offers and stuff like that so we the way we do personalization are multiple things one is promotions right so we run a lot of promotions um on both on our site and in our stores uh, but also how do you recommend products right so we have about uh, a million products just on our dot com site and when you multiply that with you know the number of guests that i talked about earlier that's a huge number and to actually come up with the right recommendation of products is a, is a huge challenge so um those are the sort of um, broad business problems that we have today um and that's um, that's where i would like to end today thank you Uh, so i don't think jean needs any introduction but i'll give you a bit so we are a brick and mortar company we make anything from light bulbs to aircraft engines uh from ct and mrs to uh, you know power plant equipment gas turbines steam turbines uh we have a fairly big uh, capital business where we have banks we have uh, 
credit card businesses. We have uh, specialized finance for uh, SMEs. So I think that's that's uh, a kind of knowledge that uh, all of you, uh, I'm assuming, already have. So the one of the most exciting things that's happening uh, in GE today is we are building what we uh, like to call as industrial internet. So the internet as we know today is pretty much consumer internet where people, you know, transact on the on the internet. They connect with other people, there is social, there is mobile and all of that stuff. So on exact similar lines, what we're building is industrial internet where the machines that we build, the aircraft engines, the, the gas turbines, the steam turbines, the generators, the Mars and the CTs and, and refrigerators and, and washing machines, we're putting them on the internet. So they're going to pretty much do the same thing that all of us do, which is check in with our status, right? So the machines are going to check in with the status saying, here is how I'm running, here are my conditions, you know, here's the temperature, here's the pressure, here's, here's the thrust, here's, uh, here's how it is working. So with that data, right, I mean, uh, you can imagine one aircraft engine would have hundreds of thousands of sensors, and each sensor producing petabytes of data and then the sensor is producing data every millisecond so you can imagine how much data it produces right so we try to get that data in our data centers or on the cloud and run what we call as the engineering models right so these models analyze the data and determine the health of the system right and then predict failures so we we should be able to predict when a particular part in the aircraft engine is going to fail, right? Or is going to reach a point where it needs to be replaced or needs to be brought to a repair shop. So that is tied to our business model, right? So we cannot have a surprise where an engine fails without us knowing that it is actually going to fail. So I think a lot of analytics that, that we are trying to do or we're going to be doing is what we call as the power of 1%, right? For example, if using the billions of, you know, uh, records that these aircraft engines produce, we can determine how to save 1% fuel, that's going to be several hundred billion dollars for our airline customers, right? So if we can tell them that here's how we can run your engines better, that's going to be billions and billions of dollars, and then we build a business model around it. So I think that's what we're trying to do. And uh, it's it's a journey we started three years back. It's going to take a while for us to get there. Uh, but I think that we truly believe is going to be the next revolution for industrial companies like us. It's not just GE. All our competitors are doing the same thing because you'll have to harness the power of data and the engineering knowledge you have and then, uh, you know, build a business model around it. Uh, and, and that's what the next generation industrial companies are going to do, which the consumer world has done for the last decade or so. So it's going to be the next revolution. That's what we truly believe. The question I have for, for the panelists is, uh, what would be the uh, the main uh, problems you can call out uh, three or four examples of predictive things? What would they be? Probably we start with the one. So as I mentioned in the first segment, the what we're trying to do is to look deep inside our bodies and see how we can solve diagnostic problems like obviously on Dr. Hugs far more serious ones, but not always so easy to solve. Um, so cancer, let's start by taking cancer. A million people get cancer every year. Cancer is caused, as I said, because something in your DNA flips due to exposure to the sun, exposure to various things that you eat, pollution and things. Um, treatment is often done blindly, but the modern treatment over the last 10 years of evolving is that you need to understand what has changed in the genome to be able to treat. By understanding that, you can modulate treatment. And I'll give you this example of the, the gene called the HER2 gene, and if you have a variant in that, if you have a change in that gene, then there's a certain treatment. And here at the NCG hospitals, they, there was a patient who uh, clearly had that change in the HER2 gene, and they were trying to treat her, and it just wasn't responding, the cancer wasn't responding. That's because they've just, they've just looked at one gene and somehow seen what had changed. And what we did was a whole a genome scan, which is 20,000 genes. And you can see that generates a lot, lots of data that goes through a long analytical pipeline, etc., which 
I'll talk about later. But then we found that there's two other genes in which there are variants and they are sitting downstream in the cause effect pathways. Even if you treat at the top, the, the guys at the bottom are just firing. So you have to add two other drugs to the cocktail and then she started to So the ability to respond to treatment is going to depend on how deeply you can understand what has gone wrong in the gene. How it is done, we'll talk about in the next segment. I'll give one more example if that is okay. Um, um, this is another family, uh, a different family, but this inherited disease, not cancer. Inherited disease is where you inherit uh, bad characters in the genome from your parents. Your parents are fine because they have those bad copies and bad characters and only one of the two copies that each of us has. But the child gets it in both copies and then that one from each parent and that becomes a problem. So here we had a family that had two children and both of them died in their first year of life. And they had some complications, you know, the blood pressure was higher than normal. Um, but nothing that looked so major that they should just die. Investigations were done and those investigations seemed largely normal. So doctors at this point throw up their hands and say, I don't know what is really wrong. I, this doesn't fit into any textbook description of what is going on. So then we again went into the genome, looked at all of these genes and then found the character that was problematic. And knowing that character helped us deliver the next baby that that couple had safely because we could test, you know, prenatally check that that baby doesn't have two copies of that mutation and predict that it's going to be okay so the parents could have the delivery and with the knowledge that the child is not going to expire in the next uh, you know, several months, which is, a, which is a great source of time. The fact that you can do all of this through a combination of, you might be wondering, where does IT, where does analytics come into all of this? We'll talk about that next. But uh, the fact that all of this can be done using analytics is what the wonder of uh, you know, this, these few years is. Okay, so for Amex, like I mentioned, the business model is fairly simple, and the business itself is, you know, by and large driven by analytics. You know, by, by that, what I mean is, you know, these hundred million people who are swiping their cards, the amount of dollar volume that runs from the merchants between the merchants and the consumers annually is more than a trillion dollars for Amex, and you know, each transaction that is done is evaluated, you know, analytically for many things. For instance, when you swipe your card, um, it, the swipe with a certain amount of data comes to Amex. And much like when you search a browse, you know, you go to a web server, you come to an authorization server in Amex. That authorization server has to decide in real time many things. Uh, the first and foremost is this transaction likely to be fraud. Um, and, you know, there are large teams, much like, you know, there are probably large teams who are optimizing search in Google, there are large teams in Amex who are building probabilistic models to say that, you know, with a probability of 0.8, this transaction should be a fraudulent transaction. And that decision then is taken in real time and the results fed back and then, you know, as the US might say, you might get a big bang for your buck. Right? So that's one part of doing analytics and it's been going on for decades. Uh, what has changed now with, with, with big data and technology is the platforms uh, and the amount of data we can use. Earlier, the, the kind of things we to make that decision was pretty limited. Now that limit has been expanded, and we could do much better prediction, much much simpler. Even than that. So that's an example of the use uh, use case that's been going on for for almost any financial industry which offers payment products. Uh, now let me give you an example quickly of something that's new. Uh, so for instance, you know, let's say offers are big now, right? You get offers from here, offers from there, Snap deal, so on. Now the question is, how do you code, you can print out, you know, cut a coupon sheet, take it to the merchant. So what Medical Express did was it came up with a concept called registered card. So, and you can look it up, you can, you know, search things like love and Facebook. Um, and what it offers is, if, let's say you have a Facebook account, you can go and you can register your American Express card with your Facebook account. Now what happens is, American Express then would start to show you offers from Amex merchants onto your Facebook you will see those offers and you kind of point and click and download that offer to your card because you've linked your card with Amex or with Facebook. Now what happens is, now you don't have to do it. So, uh, you know, let's say you go to a merchant, you know, Starbucks, Cafe Coffee Day, do your transaction and the statement credit of the offer automatically appears on your account. So what that means is, you, you know, you don't have to cut any calls, tell anybody, barcode, all of that is gone. Right? These partnerships were done not just with Facebook, but with Foursquare. So you could link your, you know, your Foursquare handle to your Amex handle on Twitter. Uh, you could link your Twitter handle to Amex handle, and you can easily link them. Now, 
what that gave Alex is a whole bunch of new data sources that he could then use to determine that you know connect to somebody who like it, more fraudulent or you don't like it, more fraudulent. Um, so now you know we have the ability to do the Facebook graph for for those people, uh, location graph for for those where they have the most user behavior, and this all done with consent. So you can register your card and say I agree to this kind of thing. So you know we're very close. So these are sort of the you know old use cases and, and what you know we're sort of bringing to market. Uh, the last is of course the traditional you know retake offer model where uh, Amex would push recommendations to you as a shopper. So if you go to shop, we know where to shop. We push an offer that you know you agree to, and, and that's all real time analytics based on your past history, past behavior, sort of classic big data uh, approach. So those are the So I'll take uh, two examples on how the big data and analytics uh, affects nurtures and helps our business model. Let's take the example of a power plant, right? So the power plant, the money that uh, a utility provider who runs the power plant makes is directly proportional to two things. One is for how long you run the power plant in a given period of time and at what efficiency. So one of the business models we have in GE is we guarantee both these numbers and we maintain the entire power plant and make sure that these two numbers are met and we get paid for it. So the utility company doesn't have to worry about when to change the part, when to take the outage and all of that kind of stuff. So when we sign those contracts, there are clauses in the contract which, which uh, you know, have us pay money back to the utility companies if we don't maintain those two metrics, right? And our ability to do that depends on one or two things. One is, how well can we plan my outage? Where we've agreed that in an year, there are going to be three outages of X amount of length. And then how I can prevent an unplanned outage, right? So, and how big data and analytics plays part of it is we are continuously monitoring the power plant equipment we're continuously monitoring the data that is coming out of the sensors and we build engineering models on top of it and based on the models run on the data, we can predict that, yes, we'll have to take an outage at this point in time and when we take an outage, that's our opportunity to change parts, you know, tune the system or, or whatever, right? Because you're not going to get that opportunity till next uh, next outage. So if we can't do the analysis of that data fast enough, and we can't run the engineering models on that data uh, at the right time, then what happens is an unplanned outage. And each unplanned outage can cost us hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So the systems that we're building today will enable us to do just that, where we don't have any unplanned outage, but when we take an outage, we change the parts that need to be changed. So it's a huge benefit for the customers, which are the utility companies, and it's a huge benefit for us in terms of not being, uh, you know, uh, not having to pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's one way of looking at how big data and analytics is is, uh, is going to be the next revolution for us. The other example I would take is from our transportation business, where we sell locomotive engines. So if you uh, and obviously our biggest market is United States, where we have a huge amount of locomotives crisscrossing the country. And the way this works in the U.S. is several companies share the tracks, right? And the amount of money they make is directly proportional to the amount of goods they deliver across the country, right? So they plan their the speed, the schedule, and how fast the engine runs, all of that based on the data that they have. So imagine that there are thousands and thousands of locomotives crisscrossing the country and they're all sending you data, the GPS data, the engine data, the speed, and where they are, the weather, and all of that. If you can combine all that data and help these companies run their locomotives, let's say, at 1% more speed than they're doing today, and that would amount into billions of dollars because the earlier they deliver, the more they can run, the more they run, the more money they make. So combining all this data and then giving them real-time feedback, right, on how they need to reroute their locomotives and how they need to rehash and readjust the speeds at which they run their locomotives can be a huge benefit both for 
the locomotive companies and you know the providers like ourselves. So there are tons of such examples across GE businesses where harnessing the power of data that we collect and running the engineering models on top of it and making real-time decisions and even relaying that decision back to the equipments in the field is going to change the game. And, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing it from you know, the technical standpoint, how we are moving bits and bytes across uh, across countries and across uh, geographies in the next century. Okay, so think about, um, you know, your shopping experience, right? So the first thing um, from our perspective that we work, um, that we need analytics for is um, assortment planning. So the first thing we do is say, hey, this is what our guests are going to look for and buy the next season. So that process actually starts six to 12 months, depending on the kind of product, um, before a certain incident, right? So that's that's where things come. Then the next thing is we need to figure out um, the guests going, you know, where these um, products are actually going to sell, right? Um, so up north, uh, it's highly possible that we will have woolens doing the same thing and so on and so forth, whereas down south, we don't need the woolens, so it's going to be a completely different assortment. Um, so that's, that's your um, assortment planning, merchandise planning. Um, then when you think about some of the new capabilities that we are building with uh, respect to multi-channel, which means that as a guest, you can place an order online um, and then say you're going to actually pick up, pick the order up in the store in a few hours. Um, that means that Target.com, the, your e-commerce site, actually needs to know what inventory of what product is available at which stores, right? And it also needs to know where you're logging in from, which is the store that you're picking it up from, and so on. That's another problem that we're going to deal with. The other capability as part of multi-channel that we're building is shipping from stores. As I said, um, initially we started off with five fulfillment centers where we could ship to our guests that order on target.com. Uh, but now with 1,800 stores across the United States, we can actually ship from each of those. Uh, that brings in multiple components. The first thing is network optimization, right? So not only have, have we got to figure out um, where our guests are going to walk in the store and buy, but also have to predict where it is going to be cheapest to ship those products from to the guests that are ordering online. So that's another big problem that we're trying to solve. Now, once we figure that out, then um, we also need to be able to personalize our offers and, uh, and promotions. Right? So that's where personalization comes in. Um, and a lot of work that happens at Target.com. So I mean, let's let's think about the product discovery side of this. Right? So first thing that most of our guests do when they uh, reach Target.com is search. So we get, uh, on an average day, this is not a peak day, but on an average day, we get about a million searches um, a day. Right? So it's important that we drive search relevancy. So if somebody search, searches for, uh, I don't know, iPad, then you know we need to make sure we are showing iPads first and then the accessories. Just a simple example. Somebody that is um, looking for blue speed in jeans uh, is probably looking for the comfort style of jeans. Right? So a lot of um, search relevancy uh, analytics that come in. Um, then, uh, once once the guest goes through the search process, then we've got to make sure that we are um, showing products that actually have that we have inventory for. As I said, we have thousand eight hundred stores. We have about three hundred SKUs. Um, uh, sorry, we have about three hundred SKUs that we deliver from our stores. But then overall, a million SKUs roughly that we have on dot com as well. Do the math. We are talking about uh, half a billion records of inventory that we are dealing with uh, every moment, right? So Imagine this, guests are buying from stores, they're buying from Target.com, they're buying from eBay, um, inventory positions are constantly changing because we have new supply coming in into our, into our fulfillment centers or stores. That's a half a billion records um, that we're dealing with just every moment, right? So that's a huge big number. So apart from this omni-channel side of stuff, I mean, you'll be surprised, some of the other things that we do, we do a lot of analytics for theft prevention, right? Um, we also do a lot of um, analytics around um, um, our security camera data. So that actually, um, you know, we generate about 250 terabytes of data every day, and that's something that we use to figure out how guests spend time in our store. So that helps uh, us helps inform us how we should be placing uh, different products. You know, our dream use case is actually that um, you know a guest walks into a store as I said before, um, gets a promotion right out there, um, saying, "Hey, you know what? I know from your research that your bank passes that you are going to be interested in." Um, say 5% off by this thing, the guest actually says yes, and then we message back saying, 
know what finish your shopping come back to check out uh, by the time you have the product ready to be used again right so that's our uh, sort of new use case that we're working on thank you uh, i hope that was an interesting opening round uh, with uh, interesting perspectives from multiple industries like credit card payments and healthcare retail and of course the technology optimization uh, hope that gave you a view into uh, how businesses uh, see the importance of financial disclosure and also applying them um, i just thought it important to to share a, a quote that i ran into some time back uh, which was by one of the senior vps uh, at gartner he said uh, information is the oil of the 21st century and analytics is the combustion engine so perhaps it has good reason why they mentioned that okay we'll probably take a few questions at this point uh, please limit your questions uh, to the first segment the second segment will be on the technology platforms that they use so i request you to please uh, ask any questions that you have related to uh, their businesses and where they are applying on any questions okay. can you have some mics for on please speak into the mic please or you talk about your mic keep it keep it this way you going to read a thread of bikes machines things computers of we also are going to do that so we will be a world of internet of the new internet will be a new internet of things so what i am saying is that if you start by getting a super thread of data from every device the machine and every car then uh, any amount of networking and damage will not be added to it so what will be more sensible will be to get only the important uh, analysis or signal for uh, what i call the indicators from each device instead of getting all the possible things from all possible devices so is there a, what is the architecture for the internet of things in I think uh, that's a great question. So that's that's the the problem that we're grappling with today. And at a very high level what we're trying to do is this if you look at the chain, right? It starts with the sensor data and it ends with the desktop or an iPad of an engineer who is looking at the data after running the models on top of data trying to make a decision. Now there are several hops on the way. So we're trying to build a federated and a disjointed analytics engine if you will for example if you take a power plant that itself is a huge thing there are several gas turbine steam turbine generators and stuff like that so when we collect the data there we do some analytics then and there and then give real time data back to the sensors and change the engine parameters right so that's that's one thing and then we send a subset of that data off to let's say a cloud which is aggregating data across the 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 power plants in that region and do some more random events so we filter that data that way so if ever we try to get all the data that sensors produce to our data centers i think what you said is just right there isn't going to be enough bandwidth even if we buy AT&T and Verizon it's not going to work so i think that that's the model we're building and that's where the challenge lies because determining what data needs to go to what level and what what information you extract out of it is is a very engineering specific thing i mean so we the it guys build what i call the plumbing right so we'll build the plumbing with the networks the switches the routers the data centers the cloud uh, the hadoop and the pig and all that but the water that flows in that plumbing system is uh, is the information that we get from these uh, things and the engineers are the ones who decide where the taps are right and then they decide where they pluck the information and they have their models which run on top of it so i think it's a, it's a, it's a huge effort between it software and uh, and the engineering teams uh, that's going to produce this so have we figured out all of it far from that right so we're still trying to figure out and that's one of the one of the things that we're grappling with
I really like the medical sciences application. I have one question related to that. Like today, uh, I can look at it. Like I can collect the data individual to a specific person. I'll be able to give more individual specific medication. Like two symptoms can be the same, but it can be for something else. Like, does it change the landscape to be more predictive or accurate uh, medication in future by having uh, collecting the analytics uh, as an individual? I'll know like tomorrow if I go for a drink, oh dude. You are right here. Don't go for it. More, more in terms of reactive, uh, in terms of more predictive medication individually. Or in Bangalore, you know, when you collect all the data, you will know for next year for this season what's going to happen or what is the disease that can come up at this point in time. Uh, around uh, medi- medication, the two proactively how we can leverage that. You're so you are absolutely right that the whole goal of you know, all of this effort in putting all these analytics together is precisely that to be able to. Identify what is specifically causing the problem in your case to be able to treat it effectively, and there are a number of examples of that I gave you a couple of minutes ago. However, I must caution you that this is an area that's going to take a few years to emerge because not everything, you know, every sneeze that you get is not directly predictable from the genome. So there are some things that it can do very well and some things it cannot do. Well. There are several things it's terrible at. It's terrible at predicting whether you'll get diabetes. It's very very good. Identifying what caused your cancer. It's very good if you had a childhood problem. It's excellent at identifying what caused it. So there are limits to everything it can do, and we have to you know, understand it more and more as we go along and get better at it. But there are enough applications today that can make a difference. Thank you. Uh, just one question. Security camera analytics. I don't know if you heard that question. I I, I got it. This okay. is about the security cameras, right? So yeah. We, so do customers know that they're being analyzed as they walk in, or <laughs> not exactly? Yes, they know that they have ca- we have cameras in the in but the store. Of course, but it's a legal angle, right? Uh, regarding tracking customers, right? Around the store. Uh, yeah, but we don't individually identify. It's impossible to identify a specific guest that walks around, right? So, yeah, with the amount of data that we get, that's not the intent. Uh, it's really to say where do guests spend time and how do they park. So you almost end up getting a heat map of the store. Um, it says, hey, here's where guests actually shop more. Here's where they spend time more. Here's how they move around. So those are things that um, you know. That's what helps with the placement um, of um, of our assortment and stuff. Like that. So that's the first one. Second use case that we've tested out is alerts. Um, you know, both from a security perspective and um, security and safety perspective for guests, um, and also for um, you know to, to drive better guest service. So um, we've uh, you know there have been cases where uh, a guest has either tripped and fallen or something like that, and then we've been able to assist the guest immediately. Uh, so something that triggered that off. We've also been able to set up alarms where say, we say that, hey, this guest is actually spending too much time in the electronics section. So maybe we need to send help out there immediately. So somebody then lands up out there near the guest and, you know, says, hey, uh, what can I find to buy? Uh, what can I find to do? So that, that's the uh, I've actually been uh, listening to some uh, uh, podcasts related to retail and uh, the the key part of the discussion was uh, uh, physical stores versus uh, online stores versus hybrid. So, uh, where, uh, how is Target feeling the heat from Amazon, and uh, how is it repositioning it as a mixed uh, kind of a experience? Is that a is that question related to analytics in general, or is it a general question? No, uh, the specific question was uh, when I. User walks in. Uh, how do you how, how do you do the user profiling? Whether the user is actually a, a physical store or an uh, online only or a hybrid kind of a user? Um, limit your answer to one second part. Of the question. So, okay, I'll uh, I'll try uh, answering that in two parts. So one is um, um, one is when you when there is a guest that's coming online, right? It's easier to figure out who that guest is, either because of the city or because the guest walks in. 
uh, and then you can tie it back to the score transaction that we have identified in the text. So there are many ways in which we identify the transaction. Uh, but reality is that a large part of, I mean, for the store guests, it gets a little more difficult unless they actually whip out their mobile phone and they log into our guest Wi-Fi. Uh, unless they do that, it's difficult to uh, find out if the guest is within the store till the point of checkout. At the point of checkout, of course, they use the same credit card they've used um, uh, on the target.com site or whatever. That time you can figure it out. But till then, it gets a little difficult. Uh, so that's the first part of the question, uh, the answer. Well, second part is we want to know exactly how we do it. The best way is to come join us. So if you want to give your contact information at the booth, uh, then we can talk about it. What is the question to the right? One last question. The gentleman has been waiting for a while. And the gentleman is there. Right. We have a further question session, so please hold your questions. So question for Ramesh. I guess for the other industries, I understand where the data comes from, but uh, for your company, it seems like not all of the data is being produced by yourselves. So can you talk a bit more about data itself? Uh, it's planning to do that as part of the next segment, so we can hold for that. Uh, we can look forward to that. All right, let's move on to the next segment. This is an interesting one. Most of you will be uh, perhaps waiting for this. Uh, this segment is around uh, the technology platforms that they have analytics to support their business. So uh, we'll have two, three uh, sub-segments in this. First one's going to focus on uh, what are the building blocks of people that are building it and uh, what are the challenges that they ran into uh, in, in building those. The second part would be on what are the, what are the challenges that they, uh, sorry, uh, what are the choices that they've made. Uh, some of them uh, have been building it now experimenting with technologies that's been available and, and building, picking some parts and building it. So how do they go about doing that? And uh, so we will delve in some of those things. So we'll first start with uh, uh, perhaps a change with uh, the GE folks uh, to tell us uh, what constitutes your platform and uh, what are the challenges you run into. I'm going to be a little bit uh, pedantic on time this segment because we took quite a bit in one segment. So can you limit your session to if needed, we can come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. My time starts now. Okay. So um, I think when we think about the platform for the Internet of Things or industrial internet, it's that not just the software platform because remember, this is not a clickstream data that is coming into your data center and you're trying to figure out or you're trying to solve the read and write problems. It, it's, it's not as simple as that. We're trying to get data from really God forsaken places where even if you get 128 kbps of internet bandwidth, you're lucky, right? So we, when we started on this journey, we started by building the platform, both hardware and software, uh, right from our machines in the field, right? So we're working with partners like Cisco and HP and others to build special switches for us, the routing mechanisms, because everything has to be tuned perfectly, right? So we have partnerships with hardware vendors where they're trying to help us to, you know, fine-tune their hardware for our requirements, right? So it starts there. And then it starts when the data starts getting into more civilized world where you have decent bandwidths, then the problems are the same that everybody faces, right? The storage, uh, you know, the speed of analysis, and 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 all of that. So, G traditionally hasn't been a big uh, follower or adopter of cloud because we are very paranoid about our data. Data is our intellectual capital. It is our uh, you know uh, competitive advantage. So we've held on to our data very closely, where we say our corporate network is the boundary and will not send the data out. But when we started on this journey. If we have to get all data into G network, then you can just forget it, right? So we're working with several cloud providers to provide us the platforms and the speed at which we can uh, A, store, B, process the data. So the same cloud providers like Amazon, Verizon, you know, Microsoft and all these guys. But we have very specialized requirement in terms of how we get data in there and do that. On top of it, the software platform we have, what we call as Predix, is something that we're building ground up. Right, and don't mistake it for trying to write a parallel, uh, you know, MapReduce system like Hadoop. 
We use Hadoop, right? We use Pivotal Stack, which is a which is Pivotal is a spin-off from VMware and EMC, and we have equity stake in that. So we're going to use that platform as a base. But on top of it, we're building several things, right, that are tailored to what we need. So it's the same platforms like you know a Green Plum database, a Hadoop cluster, and all of that. But the problem is more complex than just the software platform. It starts with the sensors, the operating system on the sensors, the switches that the sensors connect to and how they send the data. And then there's a whole security around it. Because just imagine putting an aircraft engine on internet and somebody hijacking it. I mean, you don't want to be on that plane, right? So there is a lot of security. We're building it. And a lot of it is proprietary to what we're doing. Because what we found was there isn't a standard technology that will help us. And then it's our competitive advantage as well. You should probably nudge me if I go over. Um, so let's talk about the technology stack. So the first thing um, is our data centers, right? So uh, all, all our stores data is pretty much um, within our own data centers. Uh, from a target.com perspective, um, you know, the, the front end systems are all on um, external data centers, but they're still not on the cloud. We have a private in-house cloud that we work on, but that's really for, uh, for in-house um, applications. We are now working on getting uh, what we would call the non-commerce side of target.com out into the cloud, um, right? So that's one thing that we're working on. So non-commerce non is really where uh, the product discovery happens, the flirtatious side of commerce. Um, so that's what we're doing. From a big data perspective, um, of course, Hadoop, we've, uh, uh, we have both flavors, Cloud Era and Fortinware. So we started with Cloud Era and then figured out that Cloud um, Era was not as true to uh, the community versions as Fortinware is. Um, so Hortonworks is 100% um, open. So we moved, we are, we hence have both versions. Uh, we use Mahout, we use uh, uh, the uh, as Yarn, we use Hoop, we use uh, um, what else, a whole bunch of those uh, technologies out there. We're still not doing the snake and shark, um, something that we wait to, uh, wait for it to uh, mature a little bit, I guess. Uh, Cassandra is a big NoSQL database that we use, uh, especially when it comes to Exposing our catalogs, our price, our uh, most messy things like that. Uh, even our inventory will probably go on out there. So that's something that we're working on. We use uh, Neo4j. Um, that's a graph database system manager for more things like that. Uh, funny relationships that exist between items, categories, in terms of promotions, and promotion hierarchies, and what have you. Um, so that's something that we use. Um, let's say Mahout already. Mahout, R, uh, Python, uh, SAS, of course, in the old world. But all of that stuff going in um, into our platforms. Um, so I think I covered a whole bunch. Of course, in, uh, we continue to do to make investments on you know um, classical databases of DB2, Oracle Data, Data, what have you. From, a, from an analytics perspective, uh, I think name the BI tool and we probably have it. So MicroStrategy, Tableau, and more. Um, so we've got all of that um, also in our in our portfolio. I think I covered uh, quite a bit. Uh, mobile. Uh, from an open source perspective, we are um, building our mobile, the new mobile web, uh, the data applications on uh, Backbone JS. Uh, so that's something that uh, we've gone about too. Um, a lot of work happens in house, but then we also use partners to help us out. But that's really, we try and keep IP in house. Um, then we also have an accelerator program that Nexus actually helps us with, um, you know, for us to work with startups out here in Bangalore and in Sydney. So uh, I'll make this quick. You know, in, in Amex uh, and in, in many of the payment companies or banks, uh, the backbone has been for many years mainframes, which do the real time decision. Uh, it has been related to databases, you know, which are used for analytics, and then the tools for analytics, which are you know traditional tools, which have been developed by statisticians and so on. So that that's that's a very typical model of how uh, many of these companies work. Uh, and you know, data has been rows and columns of numbers, you know, fairly large, but that's that's the definition of data traditionally. Uh, the world changed, you know, a few years ago, and now you know, you have data that's picture, text, and all that kind of structured stuff, uh, and all those are platform changes. So specifically with respect to us, you know, uh, A, we cannot, you know, no company can claim that we have, you know, cut off the benefits of uh, the data that we have in place. So given that, I think, uh, and then, you know, we also need to get the efficiency to do have like a tool for, for 
batch we have solar like cash deal for uh, you know eight million uh, we still you know like Amrish mentioned uh, it, so it's it's a practical need for companies like us you know, so, so imagine a large organizations who day in and day out build models for uh, you know hundreds and thousands of people who are building models and saying is this transaction going to be fraud is this guy going to pay is it and they have built models using social platforms and bread and butter for them is SQL query using a relational database uh, you know tables and everything else so turn them into saying okay you know hives could be hives very similar but you know using edge base or now suddenly you have uh, you know unstructured data of reference URLs coming from x3 so there's an element of taking a new platform and doing this but tying it back to what they're using to adopt it you know so they adopt it that's where we In terms of specific platforms themselves, you know, you mentioned I mean, cash deals for both the batch and other things. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, data ingestion sort of products that are very useful for us. We have Cloud Data uh, and a bunch of others. We also talk about them. We'll talk about them later. Uh, on top of that, when you know, you've got the infra, you've got the data, the analytics we have tried many open source, uh, but it turns out that. None of those satisfy habits and so forth. So, to give you an example, you know, very, very simple example. When I'm trying to say a transaction is fraudulent, I use historical data. So, you know, I could, I could have a rule based system. I say if the customer is shopping here, there, there, where he is likely to be bought. Uh, that's not very efficient. So, we move to machine learning. In this case, we give historical examples. And when you give historical examples, you have to give it enough fraudulent examples for the, for the learning to happen. So, that's the reason. And, and then the don't have proper learning, the answer is garbage. So that's the reason, as far as analytics is concerned, that's our main problem. For the rest, we uh, prefer not to develop ourselves. We, you know, do a whole bunch of pilots using Pushart, Spark, uh, real-time data ingestion, analytics, real-time query. All these are at any, at any point in time. We try and do you know 20, 30 pilots are ongoing to figure out. So let me start with the question that that gentleman asked on where do we get data from. So if, uh, as I said, we, we are looking either at the two classes of disease inherited, where you are inheriting the genome from a parent and something goes wrong there, or cancer, where you get a mutation over your lifetime. So inherited disease, we take little saliva or blood that comes into our labs here. We have we have labs here where there's a sequencer that runs. A sequencer is a sort of machine that will uh, take that saliva or blood and then spit out, in simplistic terms, your genome sequence. Uh, it's not that simple, of course, uh, but I'll go into that a bit more. And if you have cancer, then you know, you, you, the tumor that you know, a biopsy takes out, that tumor, a piece of that comes into our labs, and then again you put it into the sequencer, and that spits out the genome. Um, the sequencer itself is something; it's, it's evolving technology, but we don't build it because there are companies specialized in that that build it. Um, what we do, the first piece of technology that we had to build was um, something um, that would make this whole task of sequencing affordable in India, which means you know, if you have to sequence the whole genome, it still costs lakhs of rupees. Um, so, to make it affordable, what we had to do was so if somebody walks into the specific problem, let's say a blindness problem, then we have to take a guess of which 200 out of the 220,000 genes that are sitting in your genome could potentially be causing that problem. And that comes through a lot of knowledge and thinking out um, and expertise in the area. And then we have a way by which we can pull out from your genome those 200 genes. So, this is not like doing a grep on a file. So, you've got to somehow figure out how to take those 200 out. So, that's that's one piece of technology. Second piece of technology is once once you sequence the whole, let's say you're sequencing the whole genome for, for reference purposes and smaller subset uh, have a similar story. If you're sequencing the whole genome, you can't get one long you know, output. Current technologies are such that they'll chop it into small pieces. So, it's like taking a book, tearing it up into pieces. I give you the pieces and now you say assemble the book back. Right? So, that's now immediately you can see the analytical challenge that comes in got to take all of these small pieces and then the problem somehow reduces to a um, 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 sort of a search problem where you take all of these pieces and look them up against something and then figure out where it goes etc. Um, you could use leucine type indices for that but you have typically a billion pieces and leucine is way way too slow and you know, so you have to build specialized indices that um, that can do this search effectively and a lot of interesting ideas from data compression and algorithms work comes there uh, that we use. Some of the algorithms 
work we've done ourselves at Grant some borrowed from the Alberta community, which is what I was part of in my research uh, up there. And then it's still very slow. You know, if you have to run it on a whole genome scale, it still takes about you know, 30, 40 hours sometimes. So we use high throughput computing platforms like GPUs, etc., to bring it down to a few hours. And our latest time is that the whole stack runs end to end in, in about three or four hours. Um, there are two other big problems that I'd like to talk about, but we can do it in the second round. Yeah, two additional technology pieces that, that I'll do. So I'll do, try to do that quickly. So once you do this, you know, piecing together these pieces together, what you get is where is it that your genome is different from everybody else? So you get a list of that, and that list you have to distill down to what is really causing the problem. Unfortunately, that list is long. Every one of us has millions of things. Most of it harmless. One might be harmful. So, out of this million, how do I pick the one that is relevant? And there's a whole bunch of you know, models on genes and knowledge about various things that, you know, various modeling exercises you do to pick out the right one. And the final task, uh, let's say you're doing cancer, you find the variant that's causing the problem. What treatment can be applied to it? So, there's a lot of scientific literature that can be brought to bear. And typically, you have two weeks from the time the sample arrives to deliver back your verdict on what can be done. And in those two weeks, you have to digest all of the literature that goes in uh, behind you know, this knowledge and say that this is what might work. And so there's a lot of literature crunching. So we have a natural language processing engine that we use. And But given that this is serious stuff, you've got to have a human in the loop. You, know, you can't just automate this. We would like to go far further in the automation, though, and that those are all future things. Uh, so there's a question here. I was just thinking, uh, how do I improvise on this segment while since we're running really short of time? Uh, I want to cover a very important aspect, which is uh, what were the challenges of each of your organizations? Rather, why don't you pick one major challenge? How did you to the rest of the organization? Then I've got a four-point question where the time frame. Fantastic. Time starts now. So, uh, there are several challenges that we faced uh, G as a company. Uh, I'd like to talk about one that is uh, kind of not the, the bits and bytes and the technical challenge. The challenge was we knew that the next revolution for G is going to come through the data and the engineering models that we build on top of data, data and then how do we make money out of that. Uh, the big challenge was, do we buy something, do we go shopping, buy companies and then build it, or we outsource it, or we do something else. So that was a big discussion point several years back. And in the end, what we decided was, you know what, we're going to build it ourselves, right? So we're not a software company. Like I said, we're a brick and mortar company. We make real stuff like aircraft engines and, and, and so on and so forth. So it was a huge uh, cultural challenge for us to kind of build a software company inside an engineering company. Uh, but I think the way we came out of that was we separated a different, uh, uh, we separated out that from the rest of the businesses. Uh, we said this is going to be a software center of excellence and they're going to build the plumbing pieces like I explained earlier. And then the engineering teams from different G businesses and the product teams are going to use that plumbing to build software on top of it. So I think it was it was a cultural shift. It was a it was a very difficult decision for a company like GE. Uh, but I thought that was the right thing to do, and we're starting to see the fruits of that. Um, so a tech stack problem that we solved. So um, if you remember, I told you that we are a big Cassandra uh, uh, use case, right? So especially for any data that we got to put out there real time. Uh, however, when we try to solve for our promotions problem, right? Uh, now, Cassandra is pretty cool when it comes to actually driving a lot of consistency, replicating across uh, multiple data centers uh, while managing, you know, reasonable forums and so on. So, so Cassandra has worked really well for us in that um, in that framework. But when we started looking at a promotion problem, it became a whole different deal because um, you know the way promotions are set up for a retail organization, um, they are set up at multiple levels. You know, when you when you look at a an item hierarchy that itself gets um, really funny. So, for example, you could say, "Hey, here's a T-shirt of this style," uh, but then different sizes are different variants, different colors are different variants, um, and so you know sometimes you could have a promotion at one of those levels, but not at higher levels. And then sometimes you could have promotions at a much higher level. Sometimes you could have promotions when you buy two things together, 
sometimes you could have promotions, you know, on a card. You could say, you know, these things apply for a shipping promotion, but the total of those have to be different and so on. Okay. Um, so when you looked at those sort of funky relationships, we figured out that Cassandra was not um, what we what could solve a problem because there would be too much emphasis then back on the compute layer, right, um, or even on the server layer for the matter. And so uh, that's when we started researching more, and then we figured out we have to use graph. Uh, kind of databases. So we did a lot of POT with um, you know the graph databases out there, and then we figured out um, Neo4j actually fits our bill. Um, we don't, we still don't have it in production, but we are now um, em we've now embarked on a journey of actually really rewriting our promotions engine to be running out of graph. Okay. But there's a different problem that we didn't solve. That uh, is a data stack problem. Data stacks uh, actually claims that Cassandra and Hadoop um, they work um, seamlessly, um, but um, it has been I mean, we've been running into several challenges that we need to solve. Okay, I'll quickly leave you with one specific challenge, and the challenge comes from you know being able to integrate mainframes with the big data clusters. And, and the challenge is as follows: the output of mainframes is in a binary uh, path form, uh, and that's number one. And number two, all mainframe output data output is file based, not event based. So you know now when we want to move. Uh, Data from the mainframe onto our big data in real time and in a format that's uh, you know understandable by many of the uh, other stack elements, JSON or protocol or whichever, uh, at scale and not investing too much in the cost. So we don't want to buy you know a huge cost again, equal it to a mainframe just to translate the data. Uh, I think that's a challenge we would really love for the technology community to you know bring to your kind of next levels. So our greatest challenge in the Indian context and it's different from the US context. In the US context, uh, you know, you can afford a few thousand dollars for each of each instance that we run. In the Indian context, it's a few hundred dollars to do everything in a few hundred dollars, starting from the saliva, the tumor, all the way to giving um, an actionability report. Um, there were a number of places that we had to optimize, and almost all of you know several of those I mentioned in my previous um, uh, previous segment, um, and we got all of those down and. Now the challenge that we faced to scale all of this up was that the last part was highly manual. There was a manual step in there which took several, several hours and a lot of investment in natural language processing um, took us about halfway there, but the step is still highly manual. So we're looking in the future to look heavily into you know the natural language processing area to see if we can completely eliminate or reduce the manual component to down to a very small number. That's that's one of the biggest challenges that we're working on. Next round of questions. What would you think uh, has been the, the most uh, successful moment of the Alan Tricks journey for you and SPM as organizations where business stopped and said, hey, that's exciting? Uh, I know we lose quite a bit of this. Uh, then um, you know, there's one that's actually coming up. Uh, it's going live in August. Um, so we, you know, just our personalized personalization journey has been uh, pretty exciting. So we've not yet gone into production, but we're going uh, into production in August. So we have a two percent traffic that's going to go in there. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, again, uh, because Target has been a brick and mortar store, uh, brick and mortar organization, um, you know, a lot of the recommendations that you actually see on Target.com right now is Served by a third-party service, um, so we embarked on a journey of actually building this um, in-house. Um, and the fun part start was uh, started with the, I, I think the team size. Okay, so there are eight engineers, data engineers, and data scientists that are actually working together, uh, and one of them was in the kiosk outside. Then um, they are the ones that are actually building out the new personalization engine. So, okay, so this is the this is where the fun starts, um, and this whole journey has been over. Uh, six month period. I think it started in February and in August we are going to go into production. Uh, and some of those uh, folks actually got newly hired through those six months. Which is fun. The third fun part of this is um, uh, I don't think no more than two people work in the same location. Uh, so there are two, okay, three people in Bangalore. Um, there are a couple in Minneapolis, two people in our, one in SFO office, two in our Sunnyvale office. So completely spread across uh, and that's that's sort of fun. And it's amazing the amount of data that they have ingested, the amount of modeling that they have done, the amount of um, you know s services that they've built, the, the whole 
you know the pipeline uh, the way uh, the automated that continuous delivery pipeline um, from data ingestion right up to saying hey um, here's our recommendation will be served uh, and then for our dot com you know the, the browse teams to actually say this is how we'll consume um, the services i think that's been an amazing amazing thing Well, honestly, that moment is yet to come because uh, we're fairly uh, early in our journey towards, you know, morphing from what we used to call as remote monitoring and diagnostics with a traditional set of tools to the newer set of tools. But we've had some uh, uh, limited and very early successes in running some diagnostics on the on the offshore oil rigs. Uh, these are, um, when I say offshore, these are offshore into the ocean where you know, the oil rigs drill into the ocean to get, uh, you know, shale gas or oil out of that. So we've built some systems to do analytics uh, on the on the rig itself, uh, where it is analyzing real-time data from rotors and motors, which are like, you know, several thousand feet inside the ocean, and then giving some real-time feedback to the operators there saying that, you know, your efficiency is dropping or, you know, it's, uh, it's not functioning well, so you, you have to tweak this stuff a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we've had some successes uh, in our power conversion business where we manage uh, large ships, uh, you know, how they bank and how they uh, how they operate. So we've done some work in that area. But the real aha moment is yet to come. Uh, you know, I have mentioned fraud many times. So uh, I'll just use that as the aha moment for us. Uh, typically, fraud, you know, is a rule-based system and there are a whole bunch of people who maintain watch out, monitor, see how rules are doing, are we catching fraud, uh, and it's a fairly complex machine. And for us, uh, you know, the, the moment of glory was you know, a single data scientist who converted that to a machine learned model. Um, and, uh, you know, the scale of money is such that 0.1% increase of better accuracy in detecting fraud results in millions of dollars for Amex. Um, so it was launched, and, you know, if you swipe your Amex, you have an Amex card, if you swipe it, this code so that's pretty cool. That's the whole end to end pipelines. Yeah, for us, the you know the greatest moments of satisfaction, success, etc., patient stories, and a number of them. I related a few earlier. I'll relate a couple of more uh, right now. This this um, one family that had several individuals getting cancer at a very young age, and some would, some wouldn't. And you know, this this natural question: How does somebody get cancer? Why does somebody not? Is it not? Am I just being thrown by the gods? It's written in my my karma or what is it? You know, it's, it's, it's a general source of a lot of unhappiness in addition to the medical morbidity. And by identifying what the mutation was and identifying who in that family is susceptible, who wouldn't, there's a lot of clarity that comes into the family. Just just the relief that you can see. And these guys actually stood up and spoke at one of the uh, uh, openings that we did with HCG here. Uh, so that's that was one family. The other family is a little um, five-year-old who's slowly but surely developing blindness. We know that the gene variant that he has, he's going to lose sight in the next several years. Luckily, he happens to have a, uh, have a variant in the genome that has a particular sort of treatment that that a, a doctor wouldn't know because it's not a treatment for the disease. It's a treatment for the type of variant that's sitting in the genome, which is very interesting. So we could suggest that, and it's unfortunately not commonplace treatment, so they'll have to the family will have to follow up and figure out how to get it and all of that. But uh, but those sorts of patient moments is, I think, what crowns our our effort. Thank you very much. Next question. Very close. Um, through your experience, if there were one topic on top to have the folks building the product, what would that be? What would that be? What would that have to be? From your experience, I think for for a company like G, everything starts with numbers and ends with numbers. So understand the business model for which you're building analytics, right? So there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of data that we collect. But if you analyze that data and it doesn't result in a business model where your company's top line or bottom line is is getting affected, the chances are it will never see the light of the day, right? And obviously, if you try 10 things, maybe two of them will work. But I think uh, for us who get lost in bits and bytes and, you know, switches and routers and, and whatnot, uh, we at times forget that, you know, we're working for a, a business and then that, that business has a model. And our ability to process data and provide analytics has to drive the business. 
So I would say understand the business model and align your efforts to that. Uh, I think I agree with Raghav. Uh, I would probably add a couple of things. Um, so when you're building solutions, keep the business first. So technology has to come second. A lot of times we fall to because we are passionate about some specific technology and then we try to build solutions around that technology. So let's make sure we keep the business purpose first and the technology second. The second thing I would say um, on the same lines is um, remember the scale for which you are building. So while your technologies may actually support the large scale data, remember that you know small mistakes can get amplified when they are actually put into production. So you know these two things I would follow. Yeah. So uh, to my perspective, I think the hardest part from being uh, you know in a financial company and looking out to technology to drive business is getting an agreement on what solution to. So I'll take an example, uh, real-time SQL type querying on Hadoop. Uh, we just don't have enough sense, enough uh, you know, acumen to determine ourselves, hey, this is the solution we should pick, partly because the industry moves very fast. So from my sense, if uh, you know, there's a standard, there's an agreement, there's a de facto standard outside, you know, if I have to pick a relational database, I know where to go. If I have to pick something on SQL real-time querying, I have no idea what to do right now. Uh, so it's it's you know we end up playing the waiting game uh, and saying hey let industry evolve and we'll come to it. So I think some some help there from technologies in kind of agreeing to a solution that becomes widely adopted. That's something we would look for. It just makes our job. Uh, I mean the biggest thing I would look for from an application perspective, technology of course would support it. Is cancer treatment today is still still hit and miss. It's completely in the dark. If there was a way by which every cancer patient, let's say in India, could be tracked, where you know, the treatment that was applied to them and what happened to them was all captured neatly, nicely somewhere, the learnings from that would be immense. If is there a way of this for technologists to work together to put something like that together and convince hospitals to contribute their data to it, that'll be great. Okay, we now can take some questions around this segment. Gentlemen over there. Shakti, I have a question for Ramit. So, um, you know, again, with the data and the problem of telling the truth with large scale data, with the data that we have. So, let's say a lot of data that comes through is uh, through maybe a pharmacy outside or maybe a product by outside, which, which is disease. I mean, you, you know that you can't be your product data to tell there's something wrong with it. But you have, for, for that, you need to compare it with something else. So where do you build that? Where does that database come from? No, and, no question, yeah. yeah, and and, and how do you do you, do you talk to hospitals and others to, to get additional related information about the data? Right. So how do you build that? Right. So, so how do you, what do you compare to? So if you have to say one variant is bad, how do you what do you compare to? So there are a number of you know, options there. There are a number of people who have been sequenced and the data being publicly available. There are a number of people we have sequenced, even though each one has a disease. That one variant is wrong, but the rest of the genome is perfectly, you know, sort of normal, so to say. So, if you take care to eliminate that one variant, the rest can be treated as a normal. So, you know, you build these databases over time. So, now our databases are in the thousands of individuals. And it's very interesting because each one of you, if you're normal, I mean, you don't have any diseases, no reason to get your genome sequenced. But if you get your genome sequenced and contribute it to some public database, then there'll be some person with a severe disease will be benefited by that because a normal is like what you compare against. So, you know, there are databases to the tune of thousands, but they have to grow to the tune of tens of thousands. I had a question. To the left. Uh, are there drives? I'm sure that a lot of people who volunteer like to do a lot of work. Right? Yeah, there's a cost, unfortunately, which is what stops them from volunteering. And, um, uh, you know, I would very much like to spearhead that drive, but it, it's a slightly expensive, a few hundreds of dollars. So, check, check. So recently, G opened up some of its data set regarding uh, the flight route optimization for the community to solve. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, Strand would be open to considering something like that, considering that we have more problems than we have time or people to solve, and this could have a huge uh, social impact. Uh, and there are lots of scientists out there, lots of engineers who have the wherewithal to solve NLP problems or, uh, or apply deep learning in 
some advanced concepts so you might be able to get you know, faster results and uh, I had a question for Sanjay Sanjay from Annex Sachin sorry Sachin from Annex uh, regarding uh, fraud uh, it's a very infrequent event when you look at all the positive transactions versus versus malify transactions and it's I can draw an analogy with uh, wind turbines and flight engines failing which is again an infrequent event how do you create your ground truth data and uh, once you detect the fraud how do you how do you respond to it how, how soon do you respond to it uh, so that's a great question you know it's a rare event prediction problem no doubt uh, the absolute number of positive events you know fraudulent events, events we have in our data are sufficient for us to build a model so in a typical scenario basically what you do is you oversample and then you build a model and then you correct for sampling afterwards you know that's the standard technique for building machine learning models using real human events or real events uh, so that's one one thing we follow uh, if a fraud is detected uh, as somebody is swiping the card the immediate response is they go out so you just available to make uh, if a fraud is detected but the confidence level is low uh, because you know so it's a trade off between customer experience and sort of making money uh, by and large ms would approve but the person will get a call later on so as you know a ranked order set of uh, uh, possible fraudulent transactions based on the confidence level is kind of maintained and uh, uh, if a fraud is detected by not the model confidence levels was low prediction scores were low but the customer calls saying hey this is not my chart, it's a fraud. Uh, then that gets added to the event database, and then the models are refreshed and improved. So that's the way. Uh, uh, was there a second question? Yes, we are very open to you know doing that. Just need to figure out how to how to structure all of it. Question I had, and you know, I could relate to Raghav's uh, issue because you know we were all working for uh, years now, last year recently, and you know, industrial there was an issue related to uh, you know the Internet of Internet of Things and so on. Uh, the question I had was, I mean, I think uh, you know, Strand is different because I think it's an India origin organization where a lot of the innovation and uh, I, I guess the realistic market demand or need is 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 felt very close. When you talk of, let's say, multinationals, uh, two questions. One is how much of the real innovation and architecting of analytics gets done in India versus, let's say, headquarters in wherever it is. And the second is from da data cleansing and EI and you know data data marks. Uh, how much of advanced analytics is really done by the India team? Sir, uh, just to clarify. Multinationals are even homegrown from India. So let's say some of them do work in India. So just to clarify. So, so uh, G is an extremely global company, and you know back in the days uh, the business was in the US, the innovation was in the US. But if you look at G, the largest research center of G is here in Bangalore, right? So it's bigger than the research center that's uh, out there in this community, which is more than 120 years old. So to answer the short answer to your question is yes, a lot of innovation happens, but a lot of these projects and programs and research programs they are very global in nature, and the reason for that is different parts of the globe. We do business in more than 140 countries, so different parts of the globe have different issues, and different solutions need to be put in place. So that's the reason we have spread the the talent across the world. A lot of innovation happens in India. I can't get to specifics for obvious reasons. Uh, to answer your question, yes. From a target perspective, a lot of stuff um, happens from here. I, I think the personalization effort that I talked about, I already talked about how useful it was, but then it actually got sparked off by a test and learn that was run by my team from here, right? Which is what proved that we can actually get better, and that uh, was what uh, triggered off the investment. So that's one thing. Uh, from a technology perspective, I gave you the, the discussion on Cassandra and Neo4j. Uh, that whole thing again was driven by my team from here, uh, so that's another great thing. Um, there are, a, from a pure analytics perspective, so the supply chain network optimization problem, so that is again be, is something that's actually being worked out in India. Uh, 
So that's not to say nothing happens out there, but that's to say that you know there's a lot of work that happens um, from here as well. So I'll give you my sort of frank view, and uh, you know the, the 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 notion of innovation as far as the U.S. multinationals are concerned, it's very dependent on whether it's an East Coast company or a West Coast company. And uh, you know if you're a West Coast company, uh, by and large you would see the bulk of uh, sort of core innovation happening. It's an East Coast company, especially in this area of analytics, big data. Uh, I think the the center of gravity is yeah, and that's certainly true of analytics, and, and there are many practical reasons why that happens. Next question. Uh, I have a question for all of you, actually. Uh, uh, so I have a question for all of you. So uh, clearly, you all have benefited from open source uh, softwares, and uh, so in cases where you don't find a solution, you develop it yourself, right? For example. Uh, so you talked about how uh, you found listen to be very uh, not be fast enough, and you implemented other algorithms and uh, you know for your own purposes. So what kind of strategy do you have to contribute back to the open source uh, community for solutions like that? Uh, so I'll just take a quick example. Uh, you know, Amex recently opened a data set uh, and put up it for competition in Kaggle, um, and you know about. First prize was forty thousand dollars, second prize something like that, um, and there were a lot of contributions that happened. Uh, all that stuff is open source, uh, you know. And everybody's free to use it. It's a public data set, uh, public uh, models that are open source. That's one example. The second is things that we do proprietary inside. Uh, I think we still have a way to go where we uh, sort of get to a point where core proprietary business algorithms are made open source. Uh, and partly, it's you know, uh, like I said, Mahout doesn't work for Amex, and I think reverse would also be true. If we were to make something open source, I'm not sure how useful that machine, you know, that algorithm would be to a target. Data sets might be very different. Um, you know, I, I I doubt that we will actually ever contribute back with our algorithms um, to the community. I really doubt that. Um, those are clearly IP, um, but. From a technology perspective, you know, we built our own framework as an example on top of backbone.js. So that's something that we make. We actually even talked about it just last Friday. So that's something that may end up happening. Uh, we don't stop anybody, any of our team members from contributing to open source, uh, but I don't think we have a specific strategy to say, hey, you know, develop open source. Uh, same is true of GE. We don't do a lot of. Um lot of contribution back to uh, open source and that's not because we don't want to but the open source technologies we typically use are the ones that we take for open source and don't do a whole lot of change to the to the fundamental fabric of that tool or the platform so we use it as it is to the extent possible and what we build on top of it is really our ip and the competitive advantage that we have next question Hi, this question is for Rahul. Uh, you talked about there are a lot of sensors which, which GE has and which are proprietary in nature. So, in order for you know Internet of Things to be successful, uh, and uh, because innovations are happening everywhere, uh, some of the security related uh, data can still be proprietary, but uh, uh, don't you think uh, you should open up more? Well, I look at it a couple of, couple of ways at this. So, we can open up the data. That's not a problem because, but it's not going to be of much use to people because the only people who can make sense out of the data are sitting inside GE, right? Because an aircraft engine that GE manufactures will spit out data that makes only sense for us, or it is a proprietary information that has competitive advantage to us. So opening it up means losing revenues, right? So I don't think we will ever open up that data, right? But there is a lot of learning out of that data that gets discussed as consortiums, right? So we give a lot of that data back to the, the, the federal authorities saying that, you know, this kind of uh, uh, environments cause these kind of issues that everyone in our competitive world can learn from. But those are, that's the information, right? That's not the data that we give out. I don't think we'll ever give out our data because... A, it doesn't make sense for others. B, it's a lot of better Okay, 
gentleman real objection yeah. i uh, just just two parts to my question uh, any major challenges that you have seen uh, on network operations um and any particular incidents where technology has failed um either miserably or whatever and it has caused major headache and what sort of steps you take to um, you know number one mitigate and try to prevent such things thank you well, network operations is a problem every day so it's a very broad question but i think uh, in the context of g the biggest uh, issue we face around our network operations is because of the spread of our businesses uh, in several hundred countries right so if we go to south uh, sub saharan africa which is where uh, major investments are happening in an oil and gas and power sector uh, there is no network to operate right so you start building the network so i think the biggest challenge we have is the way we have spread the businesses and how do you manage where physics becomes your limiting factor right no matter how big the pipe is it's going to travel at certain speed and if that doesn't work for you then you will have to find alternatives i can add one more comment to that too. you know a couple of uh, until a year ago a whole genome is about 100 gigabytes and impossible at that point to transfer over the net and we were literally shipping disks going back to the good old world of shipping disks across so that was a challenge a lot of data compression work has happened since then uh, a lot of other tricks and you know we can think do things over the network now time off is that why <laughs> no so uh, so our clickstream data for example was with one of our um, uh, you know when the partners and just just the first time we were trying to get that data we had the same problem that uh, ramesh talked about so that's one uh, but uh, apart from that network operations i'm not an expert on that but um, some things that we uh, had to grapple with are you know when we have multiple data centers um, and then you got to make sure that inventory is consistent price is consistent your you know when a guest adds things to the cart that cart is consistent to cross section what have you so i think those are problems that we deal with um and you know hence made the technology choices that we made so from my perspective you know uh, failure res- resiliency is important and you know for the kind of business we do active active configurations are what's really desired but you know the active active configuration be in the legacy platforms or be in uh, you know the big data platforms there's no cost differences you know network pipes cost the same so we haven't really had uh, you know a good technology solution that gives us an active active cost effective solution for the data platform uh, backup type is one thank you we'll take one last question yes I have a question from Ramesh uh, like when you suggest a treatment so does it also have to go through some uh, regulations kind of or like do you face any challenge in uh, basically getting that treatment approved or something kind of uh, I didn't understand uh, you said do you have to, do you have to go through what uh, I mean when you are uh, finding it out some uh, uh, treatment when you are suggesting it so do you have to get, go through some uh, health uh, regulations like oh, no. by government okay. Yeah, no, so let's be clear. So what we are doing is bringing knowledge about the genome and knowledge about literature into a clinician's hands. The doctor decides. Then we have no qualification to make um, you know choices on treatment. We can bring information to the clinician for him to decide. Right? That's so all the regulatory issues about treatment etc. are the clinician's headache. We are just a you can say an analytics delivery and a knowledge delivery engine. then we'll have to wrap up uh, thank you all for your participation and i request you all to give a big round of applause to our winner